So uh, welcome everyone to um, the first uh, event in the Sir Michael Howard's uh, New Directions program for 2022. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Dr. Mark Condos and I'm one of the co-directors of the Sir Michael Howard Center for the History uh, of War. And I'm also the convener of this new seminar series. Uh, and I'm very happy tonight uh, to introduce um, our speaker, um, Dr. Tom uh, Menger. Um, Tom is a postdoctoral research associate currently at uh, Ludwig Maximilians University uh, in Munich. And uh, I actually had the pleasure of meeting Tom uh, while he was still a PhD student. Um, and he was completing uh, part of his PhD um, at Queen Mary University of London. Um, his recently completed doctoral dissertation entitled Colonial Violence in European Comparative Perspective, 1890 to 1914, examines the process of knowledge sharing when it came to theories of practice of colonial warfare across uh, the German, British, Dutch, uh, British, German, uh, and Dutch colonial empires during the fin de siècle. Um, and uh, Tom's work demonstrates how colonial violence was rooted in a common body of knowledge uh, rather than shaped by individual national cultures. So it's a, a very interesting and I think important uh, intervention into this field um, that some people might disagree with, but um, anyway. Um, more recently, um, Tom's also published uh, an article just in, in, I believe, January of 2022 um, in Itinerario uh, entitled Press the Thumb onto the Eye, Moral Effects, Extreme Violence, and the Trans-Imperial Notions of British, German, and Dutch Colonial Warfare, circa 1890 to 1914. Um, so that's the end of my introduction. I'll, I'll turn it now over to Tom. And just a reminder, uh, please uh, keep your microphones on mute until the Q&A after. So Tom, take it away. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, thank you so much for this uh, kind introduction. And um, I would like to thank you actually for this opportunity uh, to speak here. Um, I remember uh, doing some archival research for this project um, back in 2018 at, at Queen King's College at the Little Heart Center. And um, well, I'm delighted to be able to present some of the project results here today um, at this place, even if only uh, virtually. And um, yeah, I would also like to commend you for putting together this exciting uh, lecture series on uh, new directions in the history of war and violence. And I hope um, the long story I will be forcing upon you today will prove at least a bit worthy of the, of the series title. So um, I'll share my screen. Um, can everybody see the PowerPoint? Seems okay. Yes, good. Um, so, uh, okay, maybe before I set off, possibly needless to say, but just a warning here that this paper contains historical material that might uh, shock or offend due to its violence or uh, racial language. Um, I, yeah. uh, so on the, um, on the 22nd of June, 1879, an English newspaper carried the following article and it quote, when the French were at war in Algeria, they incurred great odium because they smoked and suffocated the brave Arabs who fought under Abdel Qadr. Sometimes they took refuge in caves, and on one occasion, Marshal Bujot and Marshal Pelletier sealed up the mouth and thus suffocated the poor inmates. Remember, too, how all this was denounced in England. Lord Palmerston especially went down to Tiverton to make a speech about it. And all England, thank God, that we were not as other men, not even as those Frenchmen. Well, now in Zululand, that's actually Bazutoland, um, we are done doing something very like what Bourgeois and Pilsier did, and it is not pleasant reading, which comes to us. So the quote stands here as a sort of, as a sort of teaser. I will come back to the story of the caves uh, later in my presentation. First, however, I think the newspaper article points us here to something that historians have done uh, too little, uh, to place the colonial violence of one empire in relation to that of others. Research in the field of colonial war has often remained nationally fragmented or even actively invested in theories of national exceptionalism. And in today's paper, I hope to be able to show some, to show some steps towards the trans-imperial history of colonial war and violence. And I draw here on my own, uh, on my own doctoral dissertation on the British, German, and Dutch empire between approximately 1890 and 1914. Um, and as a source base, I analyzed there a corpus of manuals of colonial warfare to distill sort of the basic notions of practitioners on colonial warfare. And I also uh, used a selection of five case studies from the said empires um, 
to study how these notions are reflected in practice. And these case studies, um, as listed here on the PowerPoint, are uh, the Endebila Shona rising uh, in Rhodesia, that's current day Zimbabwe, the so-called hot tax war in Sierra Leone, uh, the Roman Nama war in German Southwest, uh, and the Maji Maji war in German East Africa, and that's currently in Namibia and Tanzania, basically. <clears throat> And finally, also uh, for the Dutch Empire, the Aceh War in the Netherlands, uh, East Indies. Um, so for this paper, I will, I will proceed as following. Um, first, I will elaborate on, on national exceptionalism in, in research and colonial violence and how we might go beyond it. And I will then touch upon connections uh, among empires as one of the, the key elements of a, of a trans-imperial history. And it will then close with two larger case studies on, on specific practices of violence to further uh, illustrate some of the points made. Um, to start with, it's useful to remark here on, on the limits of this uh, research. Uh, when studying colonial war transimperially, uh, one can look at many different things, but my research has been focused on the knowledge and practices of, ex of extreme violence that mark colonial wars. It's a focus which admittedly has, has complicated my job quite a bit, but I also think it's the field uh, most in need of a history that, that transcends the borders of empires. Now, I realize some more words on the term of extreme violence are in order here. Um, first of all, I'm concerned here exclusively with physical violence. And secondly, there are no objective measures to define what constitutes extreme or transgressive violence. And in a way, I adopt a, 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 a pragmatic approach here, looking at what was considered as transgressive by contemporaries. The fancy ECLA period witnessed concerted attempts at regulating and restraining violence in wars between European powers, the so-called civilized wars. And this culminated in the international laws of war laid down in the Geneva and Hague Conventions of 1864 and 1899 and, and 1907. However, the use of methods that transgress these commonly accepted boundaries of civilized warfare continue to be a general feature of the end uh, of the um, sorry of the colonial wars waged by European powers in the same time period. Charles Caldwell, the most famous theoretician of colonial warfare, even saw this aspect of quote committing havoc, which the laws of regular warfare do not sanction, as a defining feature of what he called small wars. Contemporaries thus were very much aware of these boundaries of what was considered transgressive violence and what was not. Something also borne out by von Trotta's German quote here, or, well, the quote is not in German, but it was originally in German. Uh, so transgression of these boundaries thus only became self-evident in wars against the so-called uncivilized, but the fact that it had to be mentioned as such, however, makes clear that there was a distinct sense of what in European warfare was indeed considered uh, transgressive. So why has a trans-imperial history of extreme violence in colonial wars around 1900 um, not been forthcoming so far? Uh, one thing I think has been the outspoken tendency in, in military history in particular to focus attention to typical institutions, um, armies and doctrines. And both, uh, certainly for the time period under consideration here, um, were understood to be uh, national institutions. The corollary has been that the manner colonial wars were waged has frequently been assumed to be the outflow of such national institutions as well. Many scholars have been keen on finding some state-specific, elaborate, and formalized doctrine of war in the colonies, or if that could not be found, at least some national um, way of war, national school, military culture, or, or approach. And as you can see, the list has become uh, quite long already, and I'm afraid it's, it's still growing. And unsurprisingly, this has brought forth approaches that are highly uh, national exceptionalist in character. Um, and a great number of these might actually, might actually be, be familiar to you. Uh, such approaches have been particularly prominent in historiography on, the, on, the German, on German colonial violence. Um, since the early 2000s, the, the rise of interest in the genocide committed by German soldiers in Southwest Africa at the beginning of the 20th century has produced a host of publications that have interpreted the, the events there um, as precursors to national socialist, racial policy, mass murder, and destruction in Europe between 1939 and 1945. And these arguments, often referred to as the Windhoek to Auschwitz or colonial Sonderweg thesis, have been advanced particularly uh, by the work of, of Jürgen Zimmerer. 
Isabel Hill, on the other hand, has put forward a very uh, different, but also highly influential version of German particularity. In her view, the genocide committed in what is now Namibia was the outcome of a specific uh, military culture of the German Prussian army, which prescriptions proved so spectacularly unsuited for conditions in the colony that they spiraled out of control and finally ushered into extermination. For the British case, the focus on national doctrines has also produced theories of national particularity, especially around the British interwar doctrine of minimum force, which has led scholars such as Thomas Mukaitis and Rod Thornton to claim that British colonial counterinsurgency distinguished itself by special restraint. And in part, powerful institutional incentives have also been at work there. Um, this has been felt in the British and two degrees in the Dutch case, where um, National militaries after 9-11 showed themselves quite keen on discovering a supposedly successful and benevolent national tradition of counterinsurgency uh, in their colonial past. And this is obviously not to speak yet of the way this issue has also been and, and continues to be entangled with more general uh, politics of remembrance and identity uh, concerning the imperial past. And to be sure, for all these exceptional theories, there have been attempts to debunk them. The shortcoming of these attempts, however, is that they refute national exceptionality largely from within a national framework. The trans perspective is either absent or lacks a larger empirical base. Where the violence is classified as part, of a, as part of a larger European phenomenon, it remains unclear wherein the commonality is to consist beyond, beyond the reference to a number of comparable practices. I believe we really need more in order to grasp the character of what in the end was also shared uh, Western way of war, just a very different one. So to start with, I posit that we have to look for commonality in the existence of a trans-imperial body of knowledge that legitimized and generated uh, such extreme violence. This also means being attentive to the common role that the perception of racial otherness played in shaping this body of thought. The role of racism and racialized difference in engendering the extreme violence of colonial war continues to be debated in scholarships such as Isabel Hulse or Dirk Vaitas, uh, survey of European colonial violence basically downplay uh, racism's importance, seeing it predominantly as a post facto legitimation tool. However, I believe this misses an important development. While certain racialized conceptions about a war against a non-European other might once have served mainly as post facto justifications of extreme violence, the increasing repetition and reproduction over time meant that by the turn of the century, they preceded the event. It had become commonly accepted knowledge and co-determined how actors fought a colonial war right from the beginning. A process of escalation was not necessary anymore. The practitioners of colonial warfare generally knew, or at least thought they knew, how to fight such a war. The use of extreme violence had become linked not so much to the structural circumstances of the theater of war, but to the self-evident perception of the otherness of the colonial opponent. And such common conceptions of racial otherness of the enemy give rise to a basic set of precepts for colonial warfare. And I have dubbed these the five basic imperatives of colonial warfare. And I believe they stood at the heart of, of this body of knowledge on, on colonial war. Rather than by some elaborate doctrine, the practitioners of colonial warfare were guided by exactly these basic notions which were truly trans-imperial. I've opted for the term imperative as they very much sought to prescribe what colonial warfare in the eyes of the practitioners must do or achieve. It had to generate a moral effect on the opponent and had to create a lasting peace uh, by using heavy force first. It had to be bold and offensive. It had to punish. And increasingly, it also had to produce high death tolls, or in other words, to massacre. Needless to say, generally, generally these imperatives operate in combination, but it will take here uh, moral factors as one example. So moral factors generally agreed to be a central imperative of colonial war, as the two quotes here on the PowerPoint also illustrate, and they were taken from a, a British and a German manual, respectively. Like the other imperatives, moral effect was based on a thoroughly racialized view of the opponent. It fitted well with beliefs about the irrationality of the so-called native mind, its supposed incapability of rationally weighing arguments, its susceptibility to shock, and the idea that it would only listen to violence. It equally subscribed to beliefs about the alleged effeminateness of most so-called lower races. Tellingly, these characteristics, 
characteristics represented everything the European soldier supposedly was not. And how this notion uh, contributed to the extreme character of colonial warfare becomes clear, for instance, in the cost of Porter's remarks on the Zulu War in his essay titled Warfare Against Uncivilized Races. And I quote him, um, in the earlier phase of the war, the Zulus had suffered at least as happily in more than one engagement as they did in the final battle at Alundi. But the moral effect of the advance, the devastation, and the burning of a king's crown were wanting. So obviously, battle here was not considered enough. It needed additional violence to generate a hope for moral effect. But the quote also demonstrates an important link between legitimation and generation of violence in, the, in this body of knowledge. And it's interesting here, uh, or interesting here is also one of the notions uh, first mentioned in the German colonial manual as Moralische uh, Effekte, as you can see in the, in the quote on the, on the left. And this appears to indicate, in fact, its British origins as a more common German term would actually have been Moralische uh, Wirkung. And Moralische Effekte really seems to be a, a direct translation in that sense, and that the author had indeed come to uh, know the term from British context is, is not implausible. After all, uh, Peter had spent several years in London, where he had also um, read up on the, on the British Empire. Furthermore, another German colonial so-called pioneer, um, Helen von Wismann, actually, had actually counseled his readers on the first page of his own manual of 1895 to study the British colonial wars in order to prepare militarily for what he called uh, African conditions. Or actually, as he here, he says not British, but English, but he means the same. Um, which brings us to the second major point of this paper, um, transimperial uh, connectivity. As Daniel Hedinger and Nadine Hay write, it's precisely the new empirical field of connections between and among empires that, comes, that defines a transimperial history. It's also an aspect rather missing in the, uh, in the comparative survey, surveys of colonial war that we have, such as by Di Guardo or uh, Jacques Frimaud. In the field of colonial war, however, the transfer or circulation of knowledge is not easy to grasp conceptually. 10 years ago, Robert Gawad and Stefan Malinowski postulated a common Western colonial archive, quote, to be understood as common knowledge on the treatment, exploitation, and extermination of subhumans accumulated by Western powers. <clears throat> they did, however, not elaborate on the archive's precise forms nor on how, on how it might have come about. My research suggests that we should first think about such processes along the lines of what Kamisek and Kreinbaum have called um, an imperial cloud. And deliberately playing on the associations with the digital cloud, uh, the author defined the imperial cloud as, uh, quote again, a shared reservoir of knowledge, which was not bound to a single empire, but had a multi-local existence. It was accessible to agents of different empires, uh, both <clears throat> from peripheries and to metropoles. Therefore, the imperial cloud is explicitly trans-imperial. Neither the cloud itself nor access to it are under control of one single empire, although certainly power relations are still at work in determining who can access and particularly who can contribute to it. Fundamentally, the imperial cloud accounts for the, uh, quote, often unplanned and unsystematic spread of imperial knowledge and the constant transformation it underwent. It acknowledges that imperial knowledge transfers are in many cases not detectable uh, or traceable by historians, and that their actors uh, regularly also stay silent in these processes. One of the big questions when studying knowledge transfers in colonial war and violence is therefore where to look for avenues of transfer. Studying transimperiality in other fields has often come down to investigating international correspondences, conferences, diplomatic gatherings, and journals. We do not really have these for the field of colonial warfare. Nevertheless, the field had its written publications, and these are certainly worth looking into. The famous British manual by Charles Cowell, for instance, and uh, still too often seen exclusively in the context of a British way of war, actually carry examples from eight other empires. And you can see that uh, all of them listed on the, on the PowerPoint. <clears throat> Some other manuals were also highly trans-imperial. Um, these footnotes uh, from a 1913 Dutch handbook um, actually unite references to four non-Dutch publications on a single page, as you can see there. Uh, and more examples uh, can be found. Such publications, though, certainly contributed to shaping a more uh, common language among empires. 
However, I believe they reflect uh, the trans-imperial character of colonial war at that point, rather than that they brought it into being. Most of these trans-imperial publications came rather late into the found siècle, and the aspect of extreme violence was not always prominent in them. <clears throat> rather, where such violence is mentioned in reference to other empires, what is striking is its inconspicuousness, which confirms how similar it was perceived by practitioners across empires, but does not seem to uh, indicate a clear instance of transfer. For transfers, I believe um, we should look elsewhere. Um, this means at times to go beyond uh, the imperial cloud. Kamisek and Kreinbaum hold that uh, knowledge, quote, was stored in the myriads of manuals and reports, articles, travelogues, and pictures, which were accessible to all empires and, of course, also to the hats of people. However, as I would argue, the hats of people could also serve as storages and carriers of knowledge themselves. The fundamental role in transferring uh, knowledge on the, on the transgressive violence of colonial campaigning was not occupied by written tracts or official military observer missions, but rather by the mobility of individuals, be they regular soldiers, settlers, or, or privateers, who transferred knowledge from one context to another, mainly uh, by oral transmission. Their itineraries or their routes of violence, so to say, can regularly be traced, and at times such routes also crossed uh, the boundaries of empires. Take, for instance, uh, Hermann von Wismann and, and Kurt von Francois, the first commanders of the colonial armies in German East and German Southwest Africa, respectively. Instead of being representative of a specific German tradition, um, both had previous experiences of colonial warfare in the so-called exploration of the Congo Basin in the name of, of King Leopold, uh, the Belgian King Leopold in the 1880s. The fact that both have been socialized into such violence in the Congo endeavor, which itself was a highly uh, transnational venture, makes the idea of a specific uh, national tradition appear untenable. Also, it was not only the mobility of Europeans that was key. In Germany, East Africa, the initial core of the colonial army was formed by the so-called Sudanese, who were officered by German volunteers. The Sudanese had been recruited by Wismann when he set out to form a mercenary army to suppress uh, the Abu Shiri revolt, as it was called, uh, on the East African coast. Many of the Sudanese belonged to groups such as the Dinka, Shiluk, Zanlor, Bagara, residing in a region now known as uh, South Sudan or Sudan. They were socialized in a system of slave soldiering in which young men were captured to be incorporated in the region's military institutions. And their incorporation would start out as, as enslavement, but it frequently morphed into a more ambiguous uh, military uh, clientage. With the onset of the Mahdist Wars in the Sudan in the 1880s, many of these soldiers came to fight in the Egyptian army under British leadership. They were just trained after European models and came to participate in the colonial warfare of the Anglo-Egyptian army. After suffering a number of disastrous defeats, that army had left uh, the Sudan for the time being in 1885. A large number of its Sudanese soldiers ended up unemployed in, in, in the slums of Cairo, where Wisman was then to recruit some 900 of them in uh, 1889. Thus, uh, while Wisman had formed a new colonial force, the bulk of its African personnel carried extensive knowledge on colonial warfare, which was now transferred from the Anglo-Egyptian context to the German East African one. That the German colonizers highly valued the knowledge of these Iskari was confirmed as late as 1911, when a colonial military manual stated that, uh, quote, it does not hurt a European if he, notwithstanding his complete responsibility, gathers the advice of old experience NCOs and Askari in difficult situations. Um, I now want to move on to discussing uh, two practices of violence that I consider typically colonial, with which I also hope to, to further illustrate some of the points uh, made so far. So the first practice I, I want to pick here is the so-called cave dynamiting in Shona land, Rhodesia, during the Andabila Shona War of 1896 and 1897. And when I started my research, I, I came upon this still little known instance of, of brutal colonial violence, rather, rather by accident. Uh, little could I know that it would gain a curious political relevance uh, recently, uh, becoming embroiled in a controversy around uh, the Rhodes statue at Oxford. However, the case is relevant here to me because of what it can say uh, first about notions of British exceptionalism in colonial warfare, and secondly, 
amount of transimperial character, even of, of lesser known practices of colonial violence. And finally, it also illustrates the points made before about, it, about the modes of knowledge transfer. So when the Shona people rose against the oppression of British South Africa company rule in Mashonaland in 1896, the settler and imperial troops uh, sent out against them soon found out that the Shona were often without reach. Traditionally, Shona communities had built their villages on cottages or hills, where uh, caves nearby generally offered a refuge in a case of danger. And you can see one sketch of, of this um, in, uh, on the PowerPoint. Um, British attacks on Shona villages therefore ended almost invariably at the mouths of the caves. With practitioners of colonial warfare, the passivity in front of the caverns violated some of the central tenets of the colonial way of war. Yes, dude. I'm okay. No, um, where was I? Uh, so it made the colonizers appear weak and impotent in face of the so called native and supposedly uh, failed to produce a moral effect. First hand accounts testify uh, to the sense of uh, frustration. Um, and I quote from, from a letter, for instance, Alderson is, Alderson is much blamed for leaving the crowds after he took it. In fact, he seems to be floating around from stronghold to stronghold, burning the huts and leaving Jan, you can imagine what it says, uh, laughing in the caves. Or from, from a diary, um, we did not have any systematic way to try and do them harm. We did nothing but loiter about the place. Um, so it was in this situation that British troops started to insert and explode dynamite into the cave refuges while fully aware that they housed uh, men, women, and children. The myth of British restraint was still active when historian Victor Kiernan rather disingenuously claimed of this that explosives were set off only to, uh, quote, frighten the occupants, men and women, into giving themselves up. Historical sources, however, speak a rather different language. And I don't think I have to read all of these because they, they rather speak, speak for themselves, I think. Um, oh, there's something in the chat. Did I miss something? Um, um, now, Massacres in caves um, were nothing new to colonial warfare. And public awareness, however, they are mainly linked uh, to, the, to the French Empire and the so-called uh, Alfimad in Algeria in the 1840s. There, French troops had smoked to death hundreds of men, women, and children in caves, uh, causing outrage in the European press at the time. The practice was still known to Charles Caldwell when he wrote his manual in the 1890s and stated cryptically of warfare in Algeria that, quote, uh, caves and clefts uh, of rock form strongholds not easily wrested from a savage foe. More explicitly, the German Carpetas had already recommended the method in a small booklet on Germany's Africa, writing, um, the caves cannot be taken by stuffing all exits, they generally have three, with combustible materials and setting fire to it. So far, this is a story of the imperial cloud of knowledge being somehow available for download to the agents of empire, yet the exact lines of transmission remaining uh, unclear. At the same time, however, many individual roots of violence were converging on the ground in Rhodesia. As it is, wars in Britain often also um, <clears throat> in conjunction have been using the same smoking out method for decades at the South African frontier. Since the late 1870s, smoke had there sometimes been substituted for by dynamite, probably influenced by the South African mining boom, which employed copious amounts of the explosive. It was uh, likely no coincidence that a large number of men who found themselves in Rhodesia in 1896 uh, came exactly from this larger frontier area marked by colonial warfare and mining, an area which covered both the British possessions at the Cape and the Boer Republics. Even if the connections cannot be definitely uh, cannot be definitely established, everything seems to, to indicate that it was men from this frontier region who brought the practice uh, to Rhodesia. And the numerous instances of cave dynamiting that occurred in Mishonaland in these two years also became a process of um, knowledge production themselves. For um, and however cynical this may sound, its, it's perpetrators also accumulated and refined uh, practical knowledge over time. The British Army, far from considering this an embarrassing episode best forgotten, apparently found this knowledge useful enough to codify it in the so-called Precy of 1899. It was meant to prepare officers for service in Rhodesia. 
The Presidio reproduced a detailed report on how to best prepare and execute and execute cave dynamitings, not only giving the exact amounts of dynamite to be, to be employed, but also not forgetting to mention that breakfast could be had in between, and that's where the arrows are, are pointing at, actually. Um, but typical for such a written knowledge production, uh, silences and euphemisms were interspersed in the narrative. Uh, the report chose to remain silent on the fact that women and children had also been killed uh, in the caves. And uh, the curious trans-imperial wanderings of the practice uh, did not end there. In 1911, cave dynamiting made an appearance in, in a German guidebook for, for East Africa, in which it was recommended to blast the entrances of cave refuges or throwing in charges of dynamite before storming them. We do not know whether this was in any way uh, linked to the British um, precedents in, in Southern Africa. It does demonstrate, however, it does demonstrate, however, the trans-imperial range of many practices of colonial violence and how potential transfers often remain uh, revealed. The second case I wish to highlight here concerns uh, questions of German particularity and touches on the genocide of Nerero in 1904 in, in current day Namibia. And I put a short timeline of the war here um, just to recall some details. I cannot really elaborate that much on, on the war itself. Um, but this event has been described in the, in the influential reading by Isabel Howell as the outcome of a metropolitan Prussian German uh, so called military culture. According to her, this military culture prompted German commanders, above all uh, Lothar von Trotha, to cling dogmatically to a European style concentric battle to destroy their enemy. And when the Herero managed to flee the encirclement at Waterberg, uh, the German army switched to, to the second, second standard script of this military culture, uh, a relentless pursuit. And you see a picture of the Waterberg there, actually. Um, but when the German troops equally failed to catch up in pursuit with, with the fleeing Herero, they finally decided to seal off the desert and not allow any Herero to return, spelling the death of thousands in the desert. And this reading by Hull, however, um, overlooks the importance of colonial thinking in the unfolding of the events, events which, as I would argue, are much better understood in a, in a trans-imperial frame of reference. First of all, Trotta was not a typical metropolitan officer. Rather, as Christoph Kamasek has pointed out, Trotta could look back at several years of colonial experience in East Africa and China when he came to Southwest Africa in 1904. More generally, that the Germans aimed for a battle on circlement is not sufficient reason to assume that the war was fought exclusively on metropolitan lines. Colonial texts, too, preferred encirclement tactics, as this would allow to inflict high losses on the opponent and preclude, preclude a protracted guerrilla war, even if colonial manuals admitted that the encirclement was often that encirclement was often infeasible to bring about in specific conditions. Nevertheless, after 1900, it's clearly discernible in the British, German, and Dutch colonial handbooks that actors increasingly emphasize the employment of envelopment tactics to bring about a bloody conclusion in colonial war. For instance, the Dutch manual by M.E.A. Bos urged, quote, complete encirclement of enemy positions. And uh, interestingly, he quoted here a German colonial handbook of 1903, as you can see. See there, I mean, you can at least see that it is in German, I hope. Um, so obviously, Boss did not perceive something peculiarly German there, but instead a common understanding of the necessities of colonial warfare. Similarly, Charles Cowell had, in his earlier manual, still advocated, uh, still advocated leaving an encircled enemy, a loophole for escape, so as to avoid the danger of a desperate opponent. By the 1906 edition, however, this recommendation had been, uh, had been omitted entirely. Isabel Hull further holds that the transition to genocide in Southwest Africa after the unsuccessful encirclement at Waterberg and, and the field pursuit should be understood in the context of a German military culture and the search for uh, complete destruction of the enemy and so-called final solutions to problems. This, after two earlier failures, supposedly led to the adoption of a genocidal policy. It seems to me, however, that for an officer with a longer uh, colonial experience like von Trotta, what was much more important were certain colonial uh, and racialized modes of thinking about colonial settlement and ways of securing it. It's these modes that allow to place Trotta in broader trans imperial contexts in, uh, in which extermination to time could become thinkable. 
For when Trotta in, 19, in 1909 defended his own genocidal policy in a newspaper article, he made reference to a book passage by the famous British imperial adventurer, big game hunter and settler, Frederick Slew, who had written on Matabeleland in Rhodesia, and he quote, um, Therefore, Matabeleland is doomed by what, seems, uh, by what seems a law of nature to be ruled by the white man, and the black man must go or conform to the white man's laws or die resisting them. This was what Matthias Heusler has called the triad of submission, expulsion, or extermination. The basic uh, settler colonial idea that if the black man was not to submit to the white man, he was either to be expelled or exterminated. The same rationale can also be seen in Trotta's infamous uh, Vernichtungsbefehl or extermination order released during the war itself, which some of you are probably familiar with. Uh, and put it here in its entirety on the, on, the, on the PowerPoint. And I think which quite clearly, it quite clearly demonstrates this triad as well, even if um, the line between expulsion and extermination is already blurred and it's not entirely clear whether one should come before the other, but we, can, we have first a sort of the failure of submission, um, which then leads to either expulsion or uh, exter extermination. And the triad appears to me uh, the connecting trans-imperial element here. Uh, we, we do not only find it with Salou or Trota, uh, but also with other British actors engaged in Rhodesia in the 1890s. General Carrington, for instance, who would be officer commanding of all troops in Rhodesia in the War of 1896, had already raised the option of expulsion of the Indibila if they were not to, quote, live in peace with the white man in 1893, and he would do so again in 1896. And, the, uh, the quotes again are on the PowerPoint. So though Carrington did not touch on, on, the, on the third element of the triad, extermination, his language of the less mercy, the better, and Don clean appeared to come close. As we know, expulsion or extermination is not what, we, what would finally occur in Rhodesia, but it shows a similarity of thinking between Rhodesia and Southwest Africa, or more broadly, between the two empires. And there are some other interesting links between the two cases as well. Um, one might point here, for instance, to the figure of uh, Kurt Schwabe, who had served in German Southwest Africa in 1890 before becoming an influential publicist on the colony in, in German circles, and also later colonial advisor to the German government, as well as the author of one of the foremost accounts of the River Nama War. And interestingly, like Trotta, Schwabe had also read Salou's work on Rhodesia, already mentioning the book in the literature list of his 1903 a uh, colonial military manual, as you can see on the right. Um, and it was just, that was actually before the, um, the Hebrew-Nama War. And he also referred uh, to the Annabila Rising in his later account of the German Hebrew War, which came out in 1908. So to, to end the story of mutual observation, uh, we might take a Pierre Cole's comment on the German killing of the Hebrew in, in the desert. Cole criticized how the slow movement of the German columns had led the hero escape from the Waterberg, but it appears he actually held it to German credit that at least Herero, quote, appeared to have suffered severely after their withdrawal into a district of Sandfeld. A rejection of these German methods is not discernible. From his own British perspective, Cole did not seem to see, uh, seem to see anything objectionable in the final course of his events. And it's here that my two uh, main strands of argumentation of this paper uh, converge again, not only in uh, not only trans-imperial connectivity and the British attention here to German colonial warfare, but also the question of national exceptionalism. To Cowell, one of the most eminent contemporary theorists of colonial warfare, after all, it was apparently little exceptional to the German course of action. As I've argued, we need to move away from a preoccupation with finding national military doctrines of colonial warfare. With our often fallacious suggestions of national particularity in, in colonial violence. Rather, if we focus on a more basic body of thought determined by certain colonial and often also racialized images of the opponent, we will find many connecting elements across empires, elements that were influential in, sh in shaping extreme violence on the ground. And in the second step, such a trans imperial history also means investigating how colonial warfare as a phenomenon evolved in a dense web of mutual interaction, observation, and transfer among empires. As my examples have shown, such connections were rarely straightforward or manifest. 
and, many, and in many cases, we will not be able to trace exactly how an imperial cloud or colonial archive on, on colonial violence came about. Writing a trans-imperial history of this phenomena will therefore always be more intricate, less clear-cut, and more complicated than theorizing about, say, a colonial zona week or national doctrines of minimum force. It will, however, bring us much closer uh, to understanding colonial war and violence around 1900 uh, for what they were, namely phenomena that transcended uh, imperial borders. And I uh, thank you very much uh, for your attention.